Preacher, teacher, mentor, a dedicated, motivated, and anointed man of God, Dr. George W. Pryor is the pastor of the New Birth Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. A charismatic speaker who delivers God's word with practical insight and integrity from a common sense biblical perspective. Get ready for the uncompromised word of God with Dr. George W. Pryor and the New Birth Baptist Church. Truly there is a bomb in Gilead. The bomb in Gilead. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for my salvation. And as I live my life, as I go on from this very, very second, this is a song that <laughs> when I was asked by Reverend Pryor if I would just sing a song, when I'm singing for the Lord, I, I don't like to just choose a song of my own. I like for the good Lord to lead me so that when I sing the song, it is appropriate for that time and that it can reach someone who is going through something. And for those of us who are believers in Christ, we know who he is. But just perhaps there's someone here today who does not know him. Well, I stand, I stand before you to say that God is real. He is real, and whether you believe it or not, we can do nothing without him. There's good in all things, but you can never find bad in all things. For my God telling me to rejoice, rejoice at all things, no matter how they appear to be. And as I do so, I just want him. Precious Lord, take my hand.
2nd Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 10 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 10 it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord I knew a man in Christ above 15 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he saith me to be or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. And lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. There was given to me a thorn 
in the flesh. I asked the Lord three times to remove it. But he answered by saying, my grace is sufficient for thee. I want to talk from the subject, God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. Today's message is a message of grace. A message of grace. God's grace is sufficient. And let me say in advance that grace is one of the attributes of God. And the Apostle Peter said that he is the God of all grace. So I just want you to know God's grace is sufficient. And when I say it is sufficient, I'm saying that God's grace is enough. God's grace is adequate in its supply. But I like the fact that it is efficient as well as sufficient. And it is able to help all of us take the pain that life brings us and also to overcome the hurt that may be put on us. It is adequate and it's efficient and it's sufficient to heal the bruises and all of the burdens we bear, we are able to lift them by his grace. I don't know, it may be that you are facing afflictions, but God's grace is sufficient. There are temptations that come in everyone's life, and God's grace is sufficient. And according to this text, God's grace is sufficient for every thorn that the devil puts in our flesh. And we need to know that God's grace, that is, grace is God's provision for our ever need, our every need. And it's sufficient when we need it. So God's grace is sufficient. And grace is God's unmerited favor that is bestowed upon mankind. God's grace gives us what we really don't deserve. We know in contrast his mercy, in his mercy, he does not give us the punishment that we do deserve. But someone has put it in an acrostic and have said that grace is God's riches available at Christ's expense. So keep in mind that we don't deserve his grace nor mercy or any other attribute. We don't deserve his goodness. But because of his grace, the Bible says, and of his fullness, how we all received, and grace for grace. I'm talking about God's grace is sufficient. And I thought about what Jehovah said of himself when he spoke to Moses back in Deuteronomy, I believe the 34th chapter and the 6th verse. He said in essence that he, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. That's what I want you to think about. He is gracious and abundant in goodness and truth. I'm glad that we serve a 
gracious God. He's so gracious until he gives saving grace. Actually, to all of us. Titus was told by Paul that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. But I told you, he gives us saving grace. I think all of us are familiar with Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But I do want you to know, even though we're not saved by works, and we are saved by grace, but when grace has touched your life, it makes you a new creature. And you will begin to do good works. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on two good works. You don't work to get saved. But when you are saved, you will do good works. And God's grace shows us what we really are. But I want you to know that not only is there saving grace, but God gives us growing grace. Second Peter 3 and 18. Peter says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody here need to start growing in grace because grace has spared you through the mercy of God and allowed you to be here still today. So you ought to grow. But I want you to know that not only do we have saving grace and growing grace, but we have abounding grace. And Romans 5 and 20 lets us know that where sin abounded, Grace much more abounded. So we ought to grow in that saving grace. And when we have sin in our lives, we ought to thank God for grace that abounds above even our sin. Because where sin abound, grace did much more abound. But I thank God that we have sustaining and helping grace. And it's really found at the throne of grace. I want you to know that we have sustaining and helping grace. And it's found at the throne of grace. Hebrews 4 and 16 said, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Grace comes when we come in our time of need. Let me say that again. Grace comes when we come in our time of need. Somebody need to come to the Lord even this day and ask him to give you some grace and some mercy to help you in this time of need. You just may have a thorn and you need God's grace. And I want you to know God's grace is sufficient. And God gives special grace to those who are humble. I want to say that again. God gives grace. But he gives special grace. To those who are humble. God does resist. The proud. And he gives grace. To the humble. 1 Peter 5 and 6. Tells us to humble. Yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, 
casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I need us to know that the devil, as a ruined loan, is seeking whom he may devour. And you need to humble yourself and just say to the Lord, I need help. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need you to lift me up. And I need you to see me through. And I want you to know God's grace is sufficient. And as we come up to the text, I want you to understand the setting. Because there were false apostles that were accusing the apostle Paul of being false himself. And Paul is forced to vindicate himself. He is forced to defend the authority of his apostleship. And it's an awkward thing for a person to have to commend himself, and especially when he has led others who ought to be commending him. But these Corinthians are listening to false accusations against the Apostle Paul. So I want you to see he has to rehearse first of his suffering and how he had suffered for the cause of Christ. Now, if you go back into chapter 11, before we come up to our text, I want you to know that Paul was a true Hebrew and he was an Israelite. And he was of the seed of Abraham. All the places we know that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. But I want you to see that he had to contrast his life with that of the false apostles. And even with the rest of the true apostle. Paul says, if I could just put it in my own words. Starting back at verse 23 in chapter 11. He says that he was in labor more abundant than they all. Really, he suffered. He had stripes put on his back above measure. Matter of fact, for Christ, not for a crime, but for the cause of Christ, he was in prison more frequent. I want you to know that his life was in jeopardy day by day. The threat of death was on him day after day. He died daily. But he says, in death, often. But he also says, of the Jews, five times, he received 39 stripes on his back. And three times he was beaten with a rod. And then once he was stoned. And we know that he was dragged out of the city as dead. But I want you to also understand that three times he was in a shipwreck. And night, or rather a night and a day, he was in the deep. I thought about us who came through the rain this day. We think we've done a little sacrifice. But I want you to see Paul who came through these trials. Paul didn't stay at home while men were lost. But he was in journey often. And he was in perils. That is dangerous. He was in danger on the water, and he was in danger of pearls among robbers. He was in danger by the Jews, his kinmen, kinsmen, and also by the Gentiles. He was in danger in the city, and he was in danger in the wilderness. But he was in danger in the sea, and he was among false brothers 
and he was in danger among false brothers. But I also want you to know that he was in weariness and he was also in pain. He was in watching and in hunger. He was in thirst and cold and even in nakedness. We come to serve the Lord and we dress up. But I want you to know that Paul suffered for the cause of Christ. But Paul says, out of all my suffering, I have daily concerns for all of the churches. I wonder how much do you care about the church? Most of us are caring only about our own need. But I want you to see that Paul was concerned not only about the church at Corinth, but he was concerned about the church at Colossae and at Ephesus and at Rome. And you could continue. But I want you to see that some of us get only concerned about ourselves. Someone has said, we pray, Lord, bless me, my wife, and our two children, us four, and no more. But I want you to know that we need to get broad-minded to concern ourselves about others. But I'm telling you, God's grace is sufficient. And I'm telling you about a message of grace. But Paul says that I want you to see how I was humiliated. I was let down in a basket at Damascus. But he said all of this. And he comes to our text and he speaks in the third person because he's not trying to exalt himself, but he's exalting Christ. And he says, in that sense, I, let me share some of my glory. But I want you to see that my glory is because that God has honored me. But he says, now, it is not expedient. It's really not necessary. And it's not the most wise thing to do. For me doubtless to glory. But I have been forced. So I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I want you to see that Paul is saying. That the Lord has shown me visions. And I wish I had time to deal with all of that. But even right after his conversion. God showed him a vision of Ananias and throughout his ministry. Paul had vision. He had a vision of the man at Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. But I want you to know he had revelations that were given to him from the Lord. But he says, I won't boast, boast of this, but let me tell you, I knew a man.